Okay. Uh, good morning. Let's get started. Um, we're going to continue today the, the topic that Professor Sachs started on Tuesday, which is uh, what does it mean by well-being? Uh, and I want to talk about two things today. Um, what economists typically uh, associate with well-being, which is GDP or a national income or many different ways of calling it. Um, I'll talk about what that is and what, and, spe and especially important, what it is not. And then we're going to get back into some of the, um, of the uh, literature on the World Happiness Report that uh, you did with Professor Sachs on Tuesday. And uh, as you know, uh, Professor Sachs is one of the three editors of the World Happiness Report that comes out every year. The other two are John Helliwell and Richard Laird. And, um, and I've dropped that this year's World Happiness Report just came out last month, on a few, literally a few weeks ago. And I've put that in Blackboard. Um, you don't need to read the whole thing because it's really long. But the first chapter, uh, the first chapter in the world, it comes out every year. The first chapter always gives a kind of an, an overview of the rankings and uh, what explains the rankings and uh, where what countries are at the top and what countries are at the bottom, things like that. So it's worth looking at the first chapter maybe um, just to get a view of uh, the World Happiness Report. I'd also talk about a couple of specific chapters today from previous World Happiness Reports that Professor Sachs has written because I think he's written some really interesting ones. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so that's the agenda for today. I'm not sure we'll go the whole distance today. We might have some time for questions, or I, I might talk about another topic, which is the moral limits of markets, which I meant to talk about a few weeks back, but we had a review session, so we didn't didn't get to do it. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe we'll uh, we'll just uh, we'll play we'll, we'll play it a bit by ear. Just um, a couple of points from Tuesday, um, if you remember that Professor Sachs talks about the utilitarian uh, paradigm, which is basically adding up utilities. We talked about that um, in this class way back toward the beginning. And if you remember, utilitarianism is basically the greatest happiness of the greatest number. So Bentham thought you could add it up. You could actually measure a utility and, and add it up, and then you maximize it that way. Of course, a big problem with that is it can lead to exclusion because if you're adding something up, somebody can be a zero and somebody else can be a hundred and you still get a hundred um, even though somebody is zero. So you can get a lot of exclusion. Uh, but the other point of, and, and of course, when the other point of course is if you assume diminishing marginal utility of income, you get to a very egalitarian result because the extra dollar of income is worth much more to a poor person than the rich person. So if you give a dollar, take a dollar from a billionaire and give it to a homeless person, uh, the utility of the homeless person will, will rise a lot, whereas the billionaire is not going to notice a dollar. So it will be on change. So if you want to maximize the greatest happiness or the greatest number, you should transfer the dollar from the billionaire to the homeless person, except... You can keep making that argument until you get to a pretty utility, a pretty egalitarian outcome. Now, so far so good, but you might argue that, hang on a second, neoclassical economics is based on utilitarianism, but it doesn't assume egalitarian outcomes. In fact, quite the opposite. It rules them out because Pareto efficiency is all about the fact that you can have efficient outcomes that are very, very unequal. We talked about that. And the reason for that is they add, they sneak in an extra assumption, which is very tricky. And the extra assumption is you cannot compare utilities across individuals. It's like comparing apples and oranges. All you can do is judge whether a person is maximizing their own preferences on the market in terms of what they can buy and what they can sell. Um, and that's how you, and then you get Pareto efficiency, and that's that. So you rule out transfers from one person to the other because it violates Pareto efficiency. But you're sneaking in this extra assumption that you can't make interpersonal comparisons of utility. 
So that's a very important point. Um, another point I wanted to mention from Tuesday, and I, I thank Jim for this point, is that when Professor Sachs talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a very profound um, psychological framework for understanding human needs and what drives us and what makes us happy. And, you know, I'll keep coming back to this. It's all about relationships and a sense of meaning, purpose and accomplishment. Um, at the top of that hierarchy was self-actualization, which is a very Aristotelian idea that you maximize, that's sorry, that you, you don't maximize anything, that you, you actualize your potentials and become the best, per, the best version of yourself. Well, in later work, Maslow added an, 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 an even higher dimension, which he called transcendence or self-transcendence, um, which really is a spiritual dimension. And I think uh, if self-actualization is Aristotelian, then transcendence or self-transcendence is very similar to Aquinas' highest uh, telos, highest goal, which is union with God. So you can have, so there, are, you know, the spiritual dimension is typically seen as the highest dimension. And so whether you're a Christian and believe in Aquinas or whether you're, you're not a Christian, but you follow the secular ethics of somebody like Maslow, then you can reach a similar outcome. Um, and again, it gets back to what, what, what makes people truly happy or what makes them flourish. So that's just a little addition from, from uh, the excellent, uh, I, I thought Professor Sachs gave an excellent overview of, of, uh, of well-being on Tuesday, some very cutting edge stuff. Let me share my, let's get back. So we, let's move away from that really exciting, cutting edge, modern, you know, uh, interesting, fascinating stuff and talk about the most boring topic in the world, which is GDP. So just give me one second. Sorry, I'm trying to share my share this share the screen. Boom. Share. And here we go. Can you believe we're at week eleven? Uh, I can't believe how much how, how quickly this time is passing. Basic definitions. GDP is the total value of final goods produced in a country in a given period of time. It's just adding up all goods and services produced in a particular country. So US GDP, Irish GDP, um, Zimbabwean GDP, whatever it is, at a, in a given period of time, usually a year, but sometimes a quarter, um, depending. So, uh, and then you can look at the num numerical value of GDP or the growth of GDP, which is economic growth. GNP, so GDP is gross domestic product. GNP is gross national product. And you will, uh, this is the total value of all income received by domestic residents in a given period of time. So if GDP is geographically based, it's what's produced in a particular country. GNP is residency based. It's, what produce, it's what's produced by domestic residents wherever they are in the world. So all income produced by Americans wherever they live is part of GNP. So we can say GNP is equal to GDP plus NFI, which is net factor income. And net factor income is the earnings of domestic residents on all foreign income, profits, loans, remittances, minus the earnings of foreigners in the domestic country. You have to net it out because there are Americans who live abroad and there are also foreigners who live in America. So you take, you, you find that out and then you, then you get GNP is equal to GDP plus plus net factor income. Okay, so far so good. There are three ways to measure GDP and we're gonna to stick to mainly GDP now rather than GNP because it's the most uh, standard measure. There's the output measure, 
which is value added. And that basically says you just add up all the output that's produced in a country in a particular period of time. Now, very important point, you don't include intermediate goods because that would be double counting. So you, you, you use value added. So I'll give you an example. Let's, let's assume a company produces something that's worth $10, but there's an intermediate good involved in that production that's $8. GDP is $10. It's not $18. And there's two ways to reason that. Because one, you look at final output. Final output is $10. You, you don't include the intermediate good. You don't include the $8. Or you can look at the value added. And the value added for the intermediate firm is $8. The value added for the final good is $2. So 8 plus 2 is 10. You still get $10. So that's why you don't, you don't double count by including intermediate goods. And then you add up all sectors of the economy that you can measure. And that's an important point that we get to because you can't measure everything very well. It's very hard to measure, for example, government sector. Um, very hard to measure what the output of government is. Um, something, uh, and there are all kinds of problems with measurement on, in various areas. The second way to measure GDP, and by the way, you measure if you measure everything correctly, output equals income equals expenditure. Everything is the same. What you produce is your income and is also your spending. Uh, so income is basically adding up labor income and capital income. So you add up the compensation of employees plus all capital income, rental income, corporate profits, capital gains, whatever it is as capital income. And we saw from a couple of weeks back that there used to be a stable uh, relationship between labor income and capital income. But in recent decades, labor income has been falling and capital income has been rising. But for our purposes, what we want to show here is one way to measure GDP is you add up all the income in the economy, both labor and capital income. The expenditure side, you probably have seen this if you've done introduction to economics, this is basic. C plus I plus G plus NX, consumption plus investment plus government spending, or more particularly government consumption, I should say, and net exports, NX, which is exports minus imports, your net exports, your trade balance. C is spending by households on goods and services. You buy a sandwich, you buy a fridge, you buy a theater ticket, that's spending, that's consumption of goods and services. I, investment, is the purchase of capital goods by firms, goods that will be used to produce other goods and services. That's, you know, um, firms investing in factories, in equipment and things like that. It's not, the, it's not financial investment. It's not buying stocks and bonds. Uh, it is actual physical investment, the purchase of investment goods, capital goods and services uh, by firms. Um, also includes inventories, but that's an accounting issue you don't need to worry too much about right now. G is the spending on goods and services by all levels of government. So a government builds a school, um, uh, fixes a road, pays teachers salaries, that's all included in G. What's not included in G is transfer payments like Social Security and Medicare, that's not included because that's not, that's not a, 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 a that you're, you're not spending on goods and services. That's, that's basically taxing somebody and, and transferring it to somebody else. That will be included in net taxes, which we'll see in a little bit. So you don't include transfer payments in G. That's an important point. And then NX 
is exports minus imports. So it's technically it's the foreign purchases of domestically produced goods and services, that's exports, minus domestic purchase of foreign goods and services, that's imports. So three ways to measure GDP, which all should add up, output, income, and expenditure. And you get basic, um, you, you, you get your basic uh, accounting. Now, what, what we're going to do now is do a little bit of very simple national income accounting. Um, when you see a lot of equations in economics, you're often making assumptions. You're making assumptions about behavior. And some of those assumptions in neoclassical economics are a bit dubious, a bit dodgy. Remember, we talked about perfect competition. Um, those assumptions turned out to be pretty extreme, which hardly ever, if at all, hold in practice. But what I'm going to show now does not rely on any assumptions. It's simple accounting that comes from these national income accounts. It's just looking at what it is. So have a look at this. This, this looks like a lot of math, you, whoa. but it's actually very simple when you think about it. So let me talk you through it. PDI is personal disposable income. Personal disposable income is Y, which is your income, which is GDP, minus net taxes. That's taxes minus transfers. So the taxes you pay to the government minus the transfers you get back from the government. So you pay your taxes, you get a transfer. The transfer could be an unemployment benefit. It could be a direct check from Joe Biden. That's a transfer. And we subtract that away. So if you want to look at your personal disposable income, you have to subtract taxes and add transfers. Or another way of looking at it is subtract net transfers. TN is net transfers, taxes minus transfers. And then we and then to make it whole to Make, it, make us understand that we live in a open economy, not a closed economy. We add net factor income, which remember is the, um, the difference between the earnings of domestic residents on foreign income and minus the earnings of foreigners in the domestic economy. It's what this differs, the difference between GDP and GNP, because why here? is GDP, it's, your, it's, it's income within the country, within the United States, say. So personal disposable income in the second line is Y minus net taxes plus net factor income. Let's now ask about savings. SPR is private savings, savings by the private sector. Private savings is very simple. It's your personal disposable income. It's your, the income you have minus your consumption, C. But we can also come up with a concept known as government savings. What does the government save? Well, it's the difference between its income and its spending. And its income is net taxes and its spending is G, government spending. So net taxes minus G is government um, savings. Now, government savings is the opposite, is basically another way of saying that is that is your budget surplus. Your net taxes minus your spending is your budget surplus. If government savings is negative, you have a budget deficit. Uh, but that's government savings. So national savings, the savings of the country as a whole is simply equal to private savings plus government savings. It's all the savings of the country as a whole. That's SN, national savings. Well, we know that private savings is 
personal disposable income minus consumption go back to the third line. So we can stick in what personal disposable income is from the second line and you get private savings equals Y minus net taxes plus net factor income minus consumption. Shift that around a little bit and you get an equation known as the disposal of income. So Y plus net factor income, that's your total income is equal to consumption plus private savings plus net taxes. So the disposal of income is if you have income, there's three things you can do with that income. You can buy, you can consume, you can buy goods and services, you can save, or you can pay taxes or receive transfers. So that's the disposal of national income. So that's the first basic national income accounting result. I have one more for you. Go back to SN, national savings. Remember national savings is equal to private savings plus public savings plus government savings. So private savings is your personal disposable income, Y minus TN minus C. And then your government savings is TN minus G. So we're looking at national savings now, we're adding it in. But we know from the expenditure side of the national income accounts that Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX, your domestic income, your domestic output is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. If we plug that in to the national savings account, we get this huge, plug it in for Y, we get C plus I plus G plus NX minus TN plus NFI minus C plus TN minus G. Well, we, we can cancel a lot of those things out. If you cancel all those things out, you're left with SN national savings is equal to investment plus NX plus NFI. So national savings is equal to investment plus CA, which is the current account. The current account is basically your trade balance, net exports, plus your income balance, net factor income. And the current account is really whether you're borrowing from the rest of the world or lending to the rest of the world. So this is a very powerful result. It says that the difference between the current account is the difference between national savings and investment. Now, what happens if you're a closed economy? If you're a closed economy and there's no trade with the rest of the world, or there's no income transfers between your country and the rest of the world, then capital, sorry, current account CA is zero and national savings equals investment. Savings equals investment. That's a basic, basic result of national income accounting. But if you're an open economy, open to the rest of the world, and you have a current account, then that current account, CA, if you just rearrange the math a little, you get the current account is equal to the difference between SN, national savings, and investment. So the current account is savings minus investment. Now, what this is telling you is if you have a current account surplus, if CA is positive, that means your savings is greater than your investment. So you are basically lending to the rest of the world. You have more savings in your country than you have investment. So you're shipping some of those savings abroad to the rest of the world. So your current account is positive. If your current account is negative, it means that your national savings is less than investment, which means that you're investing more than you're saving 
And the only way you can do that is to borrow from the rest of the world. So your current account is negative. So very, very powerful result because remember, this is just coming from accounting, as I said. This is, this is not making any assumptions about behavior of individuals or firms. It's just simple accounting. So when you know, if somebody comes out and talks about trade balances between the US and the rest of the world, and a lot of people make a lot of silly statements about that, you now know right away that the trade balance uh, depends on the difference between national savings and national investment. It's a macroeconomic concept. Um, um, yeah, so if you are running a big trade deficit or a current account deficit, that basically means your savings is too low relative to the amount of investment you're doing. So a very, very powerful result uh, there. And this is, uh, I, like, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of math in, in economics. I think there's too much of it. But this is very straightforward because this is just basic accounting and it gives you a very powerful result and it gives you a way to understand the macroeconomics of the current account um, balances. Now, if you want to add assumptions, I can tell you that the way you get some of these um, equalities is interest rates and exchange rates move around. But we're not going to talk about that this morning because uh, that, would, that, would, that would take us too far away from uh, our topic at hand, which is really how you measure well-being. So where are we? I need to make a distinction between real and nominal GDP, nominal. So GDP can rise if either output rises or prices rise. Think of GDP as, as PY, uh, nominal GDP as PY, price times output. It's a value. So it can rise for two reasons. You sell more output or the output you have is sold at a higher price. We need to control for this because if we're looking at economic growth, we want to find out how output is rising, not just if prices are rising. So we look at real GDP, which is the value of goods and services produced this year if valued at prices at some year in the past. So you'll often see uh, GDP... Um, uh, in 2021 measure that 2015 prices. And that's assuming that prices were at the 2015 levels. Therefore, you can say if you fix the prices, that means any change in output is basically from more output and not from an increase in prices. So you fix the prices at past levels. So a way to understand that is nominal GDP is at current prices and real GDP is at constant prices. Um, so if you're, so when we talk about economic growth, we are talking about the rate of change of real GDP, not nominal GDP. So you have to basically fix the prices at past levels. That's very important uh, as part of the accounting process. And that gives us a way to look at prices. The GDP deflator is basically a measure of inflation. And it's the measure that, the measure that comes from the ratio of nominal GDP to real GDP. Remember I said nominal GDP should be thinking of, thought of as PY, the value. Real GDP should be thought of as Y, the volume. So PY over Y gives you P, a measure of prices. So one way to measure prices is the GDP deflator. Um, but that's not normally how we measure prices in the economy because for reasons that won't be too hard to understand in a second. Uh, the way we normally measure prices and inflation is through the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. And that basically says, take a representative basket of goods, 
that you think the representative consumer buys in a given period of time and look at how the price changes uh, this year versus some base year. Again, let's say the base is 2015. You look at that basket of goods and you see how much the price rises. So what's the difference then between the GDP deflator and the CPI? Well, the GDP deflator is measuring the prices of goods and services produced domestically. It's from your GD, it's the change in prices of your GDP. Uh, whereas the CPI is goods and services bought by consumers. So first difference is that can include imports. Consumers buy a lot of goods that are produced abroad, imports. So the GDP deflator does not include imports. CPI does. But the GDP deflator also includes goods that are not in the consumption basket. For example, the price of a plane. Uh, unless you're a billionaire, a plane is not part of your consumption basket. You're not going to be buying a plane this year. So it's not in CPI, but it's in the GDP deflator because it's GDP. It's in GDP. It's pr produced in the country, if your country produces planes, that is. So that's just the basic difference between GDP deflator and CPI, the real and, and nominal distinction. Let's move on. What are the problems with GDP? Now, I think the basic argument here is GDP is a very good measure of wealth uh, and income, but it's not a very good measure of well being, what Professor Sachs discussed on his class on Tuesday. And one argument is the argument of inequality. GDP is compatible with vast amounts of exclusion. And again, this goes back to the idea of it. anything that's additive, anything that measures well-being by adding things up can exclude people. And remember GDP is just basically adding up all the, in all the output, all the income, and all the expenditure in a particular country over a particular period of time. So it's additive. Um, so it can be compatible with huge amounts of inequality. Um, for example, so it's, it's not the common good. So remember in Catholic social teaching, the notion of the common good was more multi multiplicative. If somebody is a zero, then the whole product is a zero. You suffer because somebody else suffers. GDP has no idea what that means. You're just simply adding up uh, income. You're not the common good. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's say GDP growth is 3%. I'm just making up these numbers. Let's see that's 3%. That could easily mean that the top 1%, their income is growing by 10%. The, the middle class is growing by 1%. And the bottom 10% is actually falling, say minus 1% or minus 2%. So obviously, if you look at the distribution, that's not really good because the only people who are benefiting are the rich. But if you just look at GDP at 3%, that looks really good, right? 3% growth is good for an economy. But if you go under the hood of the car, you will see that that is compatible with a very bad distribution. And I just made up those numbers, but that's actually what happened in practice. So as, as I mentioned in the class on inequality, since across the world, since 1980, the top 1% has basically hogged all the, all the growth, all the growth. In the United States, so three years after the global financial crisis, this is quite stunning. If you look after the, after the, 20, the 2008 global financial crisis, 90% of the growth gains went to the top 1%. So in 
So we need to not, not just look at overall GDP growth. We need to look at the distribution of it. Uh, what are the different quint how are the different quintiles doing? How are the different deciles doing? Um, and there's a lot of work by some um, modern economists, some younger economists now that are trying to do that because they, people realize that in that the GDP itself, GDP growth itself is compatible with vast amounts of inequality. By the way, as an interesting aside, GDP basically started to be used in the 1940s uh, when, when governments started compiling national accounts, when they started basically adding things up and creating the system of national accounts we had today. But in the post-war era, economic growth was widely shared. So the bottom, the middle, and the top were all growing at the same rate. Well, if everybody's growing at the same rate, then in some sense, GDP growth is a valid, as a valid um, proxy for how the whole economy is doing, because everybody's growing at more or less the same rate. The problem is since 1980, or since the around 1980, um, you've had vast increases in inequality. We talked about this, which means that GDP is no longer representative of how the average person is doing, or especially how the poorer um, quintiles are doing. So that's a long-winded explanation, but it, 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 it's important to show that GDP does not measure well-being because it's compatible with vast amounts of exclusion and inequality. A second problem with GDP is it excludes um, non-market activities. Basically, it's adding up stuff that can be produced on the market, um, goods and services. If it's not produced on the market, it doesn't have a financial value, so you can't include it in GDP. So for example, care work, uh, a lot of um, work done in the home, which has traditionally been done by a lot of women, which is extremely hard work, uh, and yet is, is, not, is not remunerated, there's no money that goes into it, therefore it's not included. Um, but we can take this, so household activity, care work, um, volunteer work. Volunteer work is an extremely important part of the economy, but it's done for free, so you can't include it. Uh, leisure. Leisure is something that we all value, and then Professor Sachs talked about this in his class on, on the future of work. Um, you know, how do you measure? You can't measure the value of your leisure, so it's not included in GDP. Um, we can go deeper here, uh, because remember, in the Aristotelian sense of eudaimonia and human flourishing, or the Catholic social teaching sense of integral human development, which is development of the whole person in all dimensions and all people. Um, GDP excludes so much of that. It includes dimensions like something called re relational goods. What's a relational good? We talked about this when I mentioned the civil economy paradigm. Relational good is a good where the good is actually in the relationship. You have a good friend, you have good friends. Um, you derive a lot of well being from being with your friends. That's a good that comes from the relationship. The, the good is constitutive of the relationship. GDP can't measure that. How, how can GDP measure something like that? It's impossible. But that's a vital part of your well being. Um, the goods of nature. Uh, you enjoy nature, can't measure it in GDP. How do you measure the value of walking in a forest? You can't. And of course, spiritual goods, religion, um, sp um, spiritual contemplation, meditation, 
all these spiritual practices that are practiced by all the religions of the world, which are vital to a person's sense of well-being and flourishing, cannot be measuring, cannot be measured by GDP. It excludes all non-market activities. Um, okay, it also excludes the informal economy. This is more basic economic issue that in many countries, if something is done on the black market or the informal economy, and you know how this works, um, you need something in your house fixed, somebody does it for you, you pay them cash, they don't report that to the tax, to the tax authorities, it, can't get, it doesn't get measured. And in some countries, the informal economy is huge. Um, GDP sometimes tries to estimate, tries to make a guess, a best guess for what the informal economy is. Uh, but in some, in some cases, it's, it's kind of large. So you can't measure a lot of... So even on its own terms of measuring basic economic activity, um, it's really hard to measure certain stuff. GDP fails to account for market failures like and negative externalities. Remember, we talked about negative externalities. These are side effects. Your activity has effects on other people that you don't pay for. For example, pollution and climate change. GDP cannot account for resource depletion or the degradation of nature or climate change. It can't account for anything like this. So the output of a coal uh, producing um, electricity generating power plant would be included in GDP, even if that has huge, huge negative externalities. Coal, of course, being the worst of the fossil fuels that, you, that we burn. Um, so that's included in GDP. So it's considered a positive. If, if, if you produce more coal, uh, you have higher GDP but you miss out on the fact that you're creating these huge negative externalities. You're hurting human flourishing. You're hurting well-being uh, of this generation, but in particular of future generations. And as I mentioned already, it include, excludes key aspects of eudaimonia and human flourishing. Remember, human flourishing is all about meaning and purpose and good relationships, the ability to make a good social contribution, good health, all of that stuff, all those core dimensions um, is not, a, it can't be measured by GDP. And there is a absolutely brilliant quote by Bobby Kennedy, which I'm going to read in full because it's so good, um, from 1968, unfortunately, just a few months before he was assassinated. And Bobby Kennedy said, too much and for too long, we seemed to have surrendered personal excellence and community values. There's eudaimonia, by the way. In the mere accumulation of material things, our gross national product is over $800 billion a year. It's much, much higher now. But that gross national product, if we judge the United States of America by that, that gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts special locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. It counts the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It counts napalm and counts nuclear warheads and armored cars for the police to fight the riots in our cities. It counts Whitman's rifle and Speck's knife and the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet, the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry, or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, 
neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. I think that is a, as a former, I used to be a speechwriter in my former uh, life. And as a, as a speechwriter, I just think this is a beautiful um, piece of speechcraft. Um, it's so well written. Uh, it explains, it, it's written with passion. It's written with, it's beautifully written. And it explains better than anybody else I know what are the problems with GDP uh, as a measure of our well-being. It measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. Um, yeah. So there are there is a whole movement called the Beyond GDP movement, which tries to account for how do you tries to measure other factors um, aside from GDP, aside from material conditions. It tries to measure issues related to quality of life, inequalities, and sustainability. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, we will talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals basically say that you, you can't have economic progress on its own without social inclusion and protection of nature. So the Sustainable Development Goals say you have a three-legged stool, economic progress, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. And if you lose one leg, the whole stool falls down. So it kind of implicitly recognizes that GDP does not measure well-being in a holistic sense. So, and we all know that the UN Human Development Index includes indicators of health and education to GDP. That's, we saw that when we talked about multidimensional poverty. And the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, lists a lot of factors including um, income and wealth, jobs and earning, housing, health, work-life balance, education and skills, social connection, civic engagement, environmental quality, and subjective well-being. And this brings us back to the World Happiness Report. So I just want to summarize the six... As rem remember when Professor Sachs talked about the World Happiness Report, he said that the happiness across countries, according to the researchers, boils down to six key factors. Six key factors include income as GDP per capita. By the way, GDP per capita is simply your GDP divided by your population uh, per person. That's all that is. Healthy life expectancy, social support, defined as the availability to count on people in times of trouble, generosity is measured by charitable donations, the freedom to make life choices based on the question to that effect, and perceptions of corruption. So I would argue that when you look at happiness, there are basically a few key things. There's income and health. There's income as part of it and the health as part of it, but there's also your relationships with other people. So three and four are related, are, are measuring your relation, the quality of your relationships with other people, the, the quality of the social life, the relational life. And five and six are all about meaning and purpose and achievement and engagement. And um, can you unfold your capabilities uh, in a way that's not being blocked uh, again in Aristotelian sense? So even though this is subjective well-being, you're asking people, how do you feel? What is your, remember the Cantrell ladder, what is your life evaluation uh, as subjectively measured? The answers that come back are very Aristotelian. Um, they're basically income is part of it because remember Aristotle would say that if you're poor, if you're living in poverty, you're going to be miserable. Um, you're not going to be able to achieve eud eudaimonia if you're living in poverty, but you also need a lot more. You need good health. 
you need quality relationships, you need friends, you need social support, you need a society that's generous, that supports the common good, and you need the ability to be able to unfold your capabilities free from impediments like corruption. So Aristotle wins uh, in the World Happiness Report, I would argue. What's more important? Let me explain something called the Easterland Paradox. The Easterland Paradox says that money stops buying happiness once a certain threshold has been reached. And Professor Sachs, in one of the, his essays in the World Happiness Report, which we will put in Blackboard for you, argued that in the US, income per person has tripled since 1960, tripled, but happiness has been flat. Why is this? Happiness, and this is a, the Easterland paradox, up to a certain point, more money brings you more happiness, but that taps out. And it often taps out at a fairly low level. Like in the United States, some researchers have said that level is $75,000. You are unhappy. If you gain more income up to $75,000, you get more happiness. But after that, money doesn't buy you happiness. And $75,000 is not a lot of money. Uh, in, well, it's a lot of money for people who are at the bottom of the income distribution. But most people would argue that that's not, not a huge amount of money. Most middle-class people would say that it's pretty average. Um, the key drivers of happiness in all studies, not just the World Happiness Report, but all studies point to, again, these two fundamental points, the quality of your relationships and your meaning and your and meaning, a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. Um, there are, you know, there are famous studies of, of what are known as blue zones uh, across the world where people live a really long time, where it's common for old people to live into their 90s. Um, and people have tried to figure out what makes those blue zones so successful? Why do people live so long? And they, again, they point to quality relationships, the social life. Um, it's all about relationship. And this similar thing, there's this, there was this study in Boston, you can look this up online, um, which tracks men for over 80 years from all walks of life, from all socioeconomic levels. And, and they ask, they, they track these, these people's happiness and they track what happened to them over their life going over 80 years. And they ask what are vital to health and to happiness. And the answer again is social connection and warm human relationships. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or whether you're poor, you're going to have good health and you're going to be happy if you have good social connections and good human relationship. So it affirms what we find in the cross country evidence in the World Happiness Report across the 160 countries that it's really relationship. Um, if you look at the four social and institutional factors in the World Happiness Report, you find that in the four, by that I mean social support, generosity, the freedom to make life choices and corruption. Together they explain for more than half of happiness. GDP per capita on its own explains a quarter. So GDP per capita is not insignificant. It's important, but it's not the most important. The most important are the social and institutional factors. And again, this is why we can't rely on GDP uh, as important as it is as a measure of well-being because it misses out on the vital explanatory factors that account for well-being and happiness. There are also, the World Happiness Report has also pointed to some other factors um, in various chapters throughout the years that explain for happiness. 
one, two chapters which I really like, one on nature and one on work. Uh, the one on nature says that pollution and extreme temperature fluctuations like climate change are negatively related to happiness, to life satisfaction. And, and being close to forests are positively related to life satisfaction. So people are happy in the presence of nature and most people in the world are willing to sacrifice GDP growth to conserve the environment. So healthy natural environments contributes to healthy people and social connection. Nature is really, really important. And again, remember GDP does, does not account for the destruction of nature. In fact, it, it measures things that are bad for, for, for nature and for the planet. What about the role of work? Well, here, this basically says that while one's salary matters for happiness, so income is important, but a lot of other things matter too, like your working conditions, the autonomy you have on the job, your level of engagement, uh, whether you're able to achieve your potential, and the social capital built from workplace relationships, your friendships, your work friends, your ability to like create relationships through work. Again, the social nature, all this matters for work. And I think that this is uh, important um, in Catholic social teaching because we have quotes here. In Catholic social teaching, work is not just about income, Work is about being human flourishing. Work is about eudaimonia. Work is about being a fully human being. So I, I have two quotes here, one from Pope John Paul II from 1981 and one from Pope Francis from 2015. Uh, Pope John Paul said, work is a good thing for man. Sorry, I hate the fact that he says man instead of humanity, so excuse that. Is a good thing for man, a good thing for his humanity. There we go, humanity. Very good, John Paul. Because through work, man not only transforms nature, adapting it to his own needs, but also achieves fulfillment as a human being. There's your eudaimonia. And indeed, in a sense, becomes more a human being. I think that's a profound insight. Through work, we become more of a human being. Um, so it's not just about your income. It's about developing your capacities to be the best person of yourself. Likewise, Pope Francis says that work is the setting for rich personal growth where many aspects of life enter into play. Creativity, planning for the future, developing our talents, living out our values, relating to others giving glory to God. Work is a necessity, part of the meaning of life on this earth, a path to growth, human development, and personal fulfillment. So I think that's very important. And when we, about the importance of work that, and, you know, a few weeks ago, we talked about um, the problems uh, of the future of work when human beings are replaced by robots um, which can not only lead to a loss of income, but a loss of what it means to be a human being, what it means to achieve eudaimonia. And this is a much, much deeper problem. And we know that prolonged unemployment leads to terrible problems for human flourishing, not just the loss of income, but it worsens health. It impedes the educational achievement of your children. And it depletes trust and social capital, including trust and democracy. So prolonged unemployment is corrosive to human flourishing. So work is really, really important to happiness. But decent work, not toil, not work with horrible working conditions, which we see far too often in the economy today. Decent work, which respects the dignity and the agency of the human being to achieve their potential. Um, so neoclassical economics assumes that 
the worker is basically a factor of production. Well, Catholic social teaching and the Aristotelian tradition would say that you are not a factor of production. You are a person endowed with agency and dignity entitled to develop your full capacities to become the person you are meant to be, uh, eudaimonia. Okay. I want to end the lecture this morning by our arguing, asking the question, why does the US do so poorly? Remember the US, US is not too bad. It's ranked, I think, number 19, but it does much worse than a lot of the European countries, in particular, the Scandinavian countries. And one argument there is, first argument is the inequality argument. The US is a much more unequal country than say Scandinavia, which is some of the most equal countries in the world. The happiest countries in the world tend to be among the most equal. Um, the, like in the US, the average income is $75,000. But the average income of the working class, the people in the lower half of the income distribution is only $18,500. That's a stunningly low number. And it explains that despite being very rich, the inequality makes the US, there's a lot of suffering and a lot of poverty, a lot of relative poverty, uh, which affects well being. Declining trust and social capital. Um, people don't trust each other anymore. People don't develop those relationships which are really important to human flourishing. Um, Robert Putnam, back in 2000, wrote a really interesting book called Bowling Alone, where he used the example of a bowling league. He said in the 1960s or 1970s, people would join these bowling leagues from all social classes. Uh, and they would, you know, they would, socialize together. Today, there's a lot, there's much less civic engagement. People just sit at home and watch TV, or they just hang out with people of their own social class or their own friends or their own, own people of their own political persuasion. And there's a huge decline in trust among people and much more polarization. The third factor is health. Uh, and remember, healthy life expectancy was one of the key factors in the cross-country World Happiness Report uh, explanations. Um, two researchers called Anne Case and Angus Deaton, who've written a book about this, talk about something called diseases of despair. And this says that life expectancy among working class white people in the United States is actually falling, has been falling. This goes against every other developed rich country. And this is due to some things, such things as suicides, alcoholism, and drug overdose. These are the diseases of despair. And they're coming from the fact that the communities are collapsing, work is, is being depleted, poverty is rising, and opportunity is limited. Um, Professor Sachs talks about on the health, a trio of health epidemics, obesity, substance abuse, both alcohol and opioids, and mental illness. There's an epidemic of mental illness, especially depression in the United States. And by the way, um, mental health is one of the leading causes of misery and unhappiness in the world. And there's a lot of mental health problems uh, in the United States. If you look at uh, uh, the prescrip prescription drugs uh, for being prescribed for antidepressants, for example. So there's an epidemic of, of health crisis and diseases of despair. There's also, and this is also a result from Professor Sachs, um, an epidemic of addictions. Um, this is to not only to, when we think of addictions, we think of alcohol and drugs. And yes, uh, they're, 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 they're part of the problem. But there's also addictions to things like gambling, to consuming unhealthy foods, to shopping, that's an addiction. Uh, sex is an addiction. Digital media use, social media can be an addiction. 
So that Professor Sachs has argued in a separate paper that the US faces an epidemic of addictions in a sense that people are looking for happiness in all of the wrong places. Um, and I think one explanation for this is, you know, we look for the things that make us truly happy, like relationships and a sense of meaning and purpose. But when economic and social conditions work against us to stop us from, you know, unfolding our capabilities and developing our potential, uh, we tend to do things that are harmful for our health. We look for happiness in the wrong places, uh, whether it's through unhealthy practices or addictions. Um, this relates to consumerism, meritocracy, and the competition for status. Um, we live in a consumerist society. And again, people use consuming consumerism as an escape mode to escape misery and unhappiness that comes from a lack of eudaimonia. And that, and that creates a lot of stress, loneliness, and mental illness. Now, Michael Sandel, the very famous Harvard philosopher who I've mentioned already uh, in this course, has written a new book, which I've read, and I think it's fascinating. It's called The Tyranny of Meritocracy. And Sandel says meritocracy is the idea that you should be able to rise in line with your talents and abilities. Well, the problem with that is if you're blocked from doing that, if you're blocked from your eudaimonia and you're told you live in a meritocracy, well, you lose your self-esteem. You lose your self-esteem if you lose out. But even if you win, you lose. Why is that? Because you're constant, even for the winners, the constant striving for status against your fellow citizens creates stress and mental health problems. So on one hand, you lose self-esteem. And on the other hand, you create stress from the constant need for social status. Now, if this sounds familiar, remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about in the context of inequality, the work of Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, when they said something similar about the prevalence of inequality in a society that you get a lot because you have a lot of social distancing and a lot of beliefs that you earn what you get, that you get a lot of um, anxiety and mental health uh, disorders from a lot of this, uh, these same factors. Uh, but these certainly would fit into why the US uh, does so poorly on happiness. I want to mention a final point, which is not particularly related to US, the US, but it's a general point, is that virtual community does not bring real happiness. There was a study in last year's World Happiness Report that discusses a huge decline in happiness among teenagers and adolescents. Um, a lot of mental health challenges there. I mean, I think we're all well aware of that. And there's a huge debate over what's driving that right now. I think one problem is a lack of trust in the future. Um, what kind of world are you growing up in? A world of climate change, a world where there's no jobs, a world where you face monstrous debt if you want to go to college. All of these issues will create unhappiness. But there's also the factor that digital media, social media can lead to mental health disorders and self-harm among teenagers and adolescents uh, for reasons that we all know that, that, are, that, are, that, that should be quite clear to everybody. Uh, and I think that the, the moral of that story is that virtual community does not bring real community. And it's funny when you think of it, if we, if we lose our real community, if we lose out our real relationships, the market will step in and create false relationships. Your Facebook friends are not your real friends. I mean, we all know that, but we all hang out on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these things. And I would argue that this is not making us happy. 
because there are not real relationships. Real relationships make us happy. Okay, I have two minutes to go. That's what I wanted to talk about today. Well-being, GDP, some basic GDP accounting, um, so GDP is important and every economics, every economist has to understand GDP and its accounting is important, but it does not measure well-being and I, uh, for the reasons which I tried to go over. Uh, two minutes, any questions, comments? Homework due Monday, anytime, anytime on Monday. So by 11.59 p.m., please have your homework in. Um, it's short. Uh, I'm looking forward to your topics because I don't know what you're going to write about. And uh, I'm excited to see what you come up with. In Blackboard, I, I just added one announcement. I added one of Professor Sachs, by the way, seems to write an op-ed a week. So he is the master op-ed writer. So if you want some ideas, read some of his op-eds. Um, don't necessarily take his topics. Uh, you can take anything you want. Um, but I'm excited to see what you come up with. Uh, this is an open-ended one. Uh, by the way, Paul Krugman has um, an interesting op-ed in the New York Times today criticizing Andrew Yang's um, UBI proposal. Don't write on UBI. You're, 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 you're not allowed to write on UBI, but, it's an in, but read Krugman. It's an interesting op-ed. Uh, it, it's a, Krugman is another excellent op-ed writer that, uh, that I encourage people to read. Okay. You want this submitted through email, right? Yeah, just email it to me. The, 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 usual, the usual way. It's, you know, this Zoom teaching is not ideal. Emailing uh, homework is not ideal, but that's the way it works. So yeah, just email it to me. Yeah, sometime on Monday. And if you want to talk, if you have any ideas, you want to bounce off me, also just email me. But remember that the word count is rigid. I don't... Uh, I don't want nothing less than 700 words, nothing more than 1,000 words, and we're going to strictly enforce that because an op-ed is supposed to be in a confined space. It's, you're supposed to make a very succinct argument. Okay, it's 11.15. As always, I will stay on the Zoom to uh, take any, if anybody wants to have any questions or comments or chat. Um, this is your virtual office hours, so I will stay on. Uh, otherwise, I wish you all a wonderful spring weekend. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. You too. Thank you, Professor.